Hello, folks, and thanks for joining me for the 30th reading on the Freemasonic Knowledge Channel. Let's see. For this reading, it was called Gold, Silver, Brass, Iron, or The Four Masonic Values in the Euclid Lodge by Rob Morris. Euclid Lodge is a good lodge for work and far beyond the ordinary, for practical benevolence and fraternity. Strangers who have visited Washaw County have declared it to be a matter of surprise to them how so well or governed and well informed a lodge as Euclid ever got there. Although it is not situated at the county seat and is but one amongst six in the county, Yet there is no lodge in the state with a sounder membership, and it is not at all uncommon for applicants to obtain permission from the lodges nearest which they live to come up from a considerable distance to Euclid, and if found worthy to be made masons there. The membership of Euclid Lodge, however, is not numerous, but little over the old standard, in fact, for they do not follow the modern notion of making members of all whom they make masons far from it the last report of the secretary brother plum who to the grand lodge gives 54 master masons as the total of membership the reasons why they have no more are found in a small handful of black marbles at the farther end of the ballot box those reasons are considered amply sufficient the worshipful master of Euclid Lodge, Brother Coverley, has somewhere picked up the following tradition and seems never so happy as when he is telling it once a month to his brethren in open lodge. At the building of the King Solomon's Temple, bands of the fellow crafts, eighty men in each, were sent to Mount Lebanon to examine the cedar trees, while the ten thousand Jews under Adoniram followed after to cut them down. Every tree was scrutinized by eighty pairs of eyes, and if any one of them observed the minutest defect, such as a crook, a crack, wind shake, knot hole, decay, or flaw of any sort, he marked it, not being called upon to give his reasons, and that cedar tree stood rejected. So well known abroad as you could lodge for the virtue of good fellowship, that its representative in the Grand Lodge is invariably appointed a chairman of the Committee of Complaints and Appeals, an office for which he is considered well qualified on account of the many compromises he has witnessed at home. For the Supreme Court itself is not better known as a tribunal of last resort than is Euclid Lodge. Whenever a serious difficulty springs up between brethren of a neighboring lodge or between a member and one of those amphibious creatures styled demented masons, it most assuredly finds its way to Euclid Lodge at last, and it is worth any man's $25 to see Brother Coverley sitting behind his monstrous big goggles he declares that he can't sit up late at night unless he guards his eyes with green glass. Presiding at one of these appeal cases. The code of practice at this court is uniform and simple. First, he requires a pledge from both parties that they will stand to and abide by the decision of the lodge. Then he hears both sides and unwearied with unwearied patience, it has been whispered that he goes out to sleep behind the goggles aforesaid. Then he makes both parties acknowledge themselves partly wrong and shake hands over the holy spot. Then comes a speech from Brother Calverly, a heartfelt prayer from gray-headed Parson Lowe, a shaking of hands and handkerchiefs all around. And then the lodge closes, and that's the last you ever hear of it. People outside may go wild with curiosity. It makes no difference. The thing is locked up, and the key is lost. They may waylay the Masons on their road home and try to entrap them with questions all in vain. How did the trial come out? A solemn stare is the only response. 
Did the parties make their statements? No answer. Didn't Higgs call Diggs a liar? A gentle whistle tune. Freemasons march. Well then, how was the thing settled? A smile and a turning away, a scratching of heads and a general disappointment. That's just the way they did when Stovall was accused of kicking Marcus, knowing him to be a Mason. And to this day, old Mother Pelote has labored in vain to get at the particulars. Ah, bless your heart, there's no leaky barrels in Euclid Lodge. The bungs are well drove in, the hoops hammered down and riveted. The whole lodge is tight as a drum. The members have often enough been cautioned that the manner in which masons settle their difficulties is one of impenetrable secrets of the one of the impenetrable secrets of the art. This is in accordance with the well known views of Dr. Oliver, the sage historian of masonry, who advises that all differences which may occur amongst us ought to be kept secret from the world. The decree of provost and judge was instituted by Solomon to hear complaints and decide differences. End quote. The amiable character of Euclid Lodge is so noted that the colonies which go out from her every year or two to organize new lodges as a begum expands itself in new swarms may be recognized by their family re resemblance. The sapient Sam Slick in his book of travel says, and I quote, the character of the mother is a pure or a sure index to the character of the daughter, end quote. And so it proves here, for no lodges in the state rank higher on the books of the Grand Lodge than these offshoots of Euclid. But highly exalted as Euclid Lodge is and deserves to be, it has nevertheless a variety of its mem membership, and this variety it is that it has suggested the title of this sketch, Gold, Silver, Brass, and Iron. Four grades are distinctly marked, even as these four metals were used in the temple of the King Solomon. And we greatly err if it does not prove upon examination that every other lodge possesses nearly the same variety. Let us commence at the iron value. Squire Blunt is a fair specimen of this material. He became a mason principally because his neighbors did. He continues his membership in the lodge because he likes to hear. Oops, sorry about that with the mic. He likes to hear it said that he is a mason. He wears a masonic breastpin, and has painted a square and compass on his sign, both being for the purpose of affording prima facie evidence to the same effect. He pays his lodge dues only occasionally. Is always astonished to find that they have run up so large. He's convinced that the secretary forgot to enter his last payment, hunts over his papers at home for the receipt, fails to find it, then gives it up with a grumble. Whenever he visits the lodge, which is very rarely the case except at elections, installations, and funeral occasions, he has a resolution to offer that the quarterage dues be reduced one half, declaring that for the life of him he doesn't see what becomes of all the money. <laughs> He would like very much to hold office and frequently proposes that Euclid Lodge should fall into the modern practice of holding elections semi-annually in hopes that his turn would come, sooner the, would come the sooner. When a stranger falls into the neighborhood to visit an acquaintance or to look for land, Squire Blunt is usually foremost to hail him as a mason to examine him and then who but he is ready to take him by the hand, introduce him into the lodge room, and boldly vouch for him. Squire Blunt invariably objects to the score of expense, to the employment of the authorized lecturer when he comes around, and as one noisy man can sometimes do much more harm than the score of sensible folks can remedy, he did once succeed at, in preventing an engagement of this sort greatly to the injury of the lodge. The squire has no Masonic books, but being fond of reading such things, he depends upon borrowing from others. He adopts the same economical rule concerning Masonic magazines and newspapers. Squire Blunt has very limited notions of the cable toe. It is not m more than three miles long, in his opinion, 
and some of the brethren have whispered that that particular rope which he holds on to is somewhat warped at that, <laughs> perhaps for the want of use. It was on this account that when Bennington Lodge lost its hall by fire, and when Crosswell Lodge appealed to the Masonic Charities on behalf of their orphan school, and when the poor Hungarian brother, who was collecting means to bring his family to America, came with a recommendatory letter from the Grand Master, none of these things moved the heart of the Squire Blunt. He declared, one inch, they were not within the length of his cable, toe, and who could gainsay his declaration? Squire Blunt is more liable to be imposed upon than other masons in his vicinity. For instance, he was overtaken one day on the road by a cute Yankee fellow in a rifle trade, who, passing himself off on the squire as a royal art mason, got a five-dollar bill out of him for an old copy of Allen's Ritual that veritable veritable exposition of all the degrees and a good deal more but when squire blunt brought his costly purchase to the lodge and triumphantly exhibited it brother coverly put on his large green goggles looked it through from end to end and then dropping it softly into the stove he remarked in his sweet mild way either this exposition is true or false if true you have no right to handle the perjured leaves. If false, you have no use for it. In either case, you are acting unmasonically to patronize the enemies of morality by paying out your money for these works. End quote. And so Squire Blunt lost his five dollars. Brethren who read this little sketch, have you any member of the iron value in your lodge? The brass value. Brass is not so much a metal in itself as a compound of other metals, and the mixture is very little like the original Dr. Swayze is a specimen of the brass value in the Euclid Lodge. Dr. Swayze <laughs> has many excellent Masonic qualities. He pays his quarterage dues like a hero. His cable toe reaches to the furthest parts of the earth and comprehends all mankind in a single coil. The fact is, the doctor is so good-hearted and benevolent to all men that he can hardly proportion his bounties to any particular class above the rest. Dr. Swayze is extravagantly fond of side degrees. He has got them all, and the glory is in having them all. Lie has been ground over in the button factory degree, burnt his fingers in the call and answer, plead to the scandalous charges in the blue hen, tussled manfully in the row your own oar, shot his arrow, eat his words, held on to his cable toe, been down to Joppa, or Joppa, and con conquered divers temptations in short. His education in this branch is complete. Finding the thing so easy, he manufactured a side degree for himself called the pestle and mortar. But as none but physicians can take it, we are in the dark as to its mysteries. But we have been told that the candidate commences by swallowing twelve pills in succession as a trial of his fortitude. <laughs> and here now lies the error of Dr. Swayze. His mental is too much compounded. He has more zeal than discretion. No person in the lodge is better prepared to be a bright mason than he. His library of Masonic book, books is large, the largest in the district. He has the education to understand them, and the talent to apply them. But his Masonic reputation is not first-rate, for he attaches himself to every secret society that springs up, and devotes as much time and means to one as the other. He seems unable to discriminate between an association born within a half century and one that has stood the brunt of twenty-eight centuries. In the tenets of masonry, Dr. Swayze is as apt as any other person, in brotherly love, relief, and truth, likewise in the cardinal virtues of temperance, fortitude, prudence, and justice. But even here his brassy compound value is visible for he has got his temperance so much mixed up with temperance's societies and his relief with the mutual relief associations that for the life of him he cannot see the difference 
but it is much more pleasant to commend than to blame. The charitable disposition of Dr. Swayze is so well understood by his brethren that when a contribution is to be made up, they always put his name down, whether present or not, and he fulfills their expectations like a Trojan. When Brother June died, leaving his family in destitute condition, the doctor sent in his account for a medical attendance receipted in full, and furthermore declared himself indebted to the estate seven dollars. It was a falsehood, but the angel smiled over it and refused to report it as, <laughs> at the heavenly east, and he paid over the seven dollars to the widow. Yet there is another fault this brassy brother has. He has got into the er 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 erroneous idea that as masonry doesn't take away any privileges which a man possessed before he joined the order, therefore if a person insults you, you may knock him down, mason or no mason. This doctrine is not pure gold, like eclectus. It is brass. The doctor is wrong in his premises. Therefore, he errs mater materially in his conclusions. He goes beyond the parallels and the book. No wonder, then, in, if his orbit becomes, in this respect, a lawless one. we got a lot of brassies nowadays, don't we? Brother Swayze belongs to the progressive party in masonry. <laughs> he believes in going ahead. Well, sure, he, of course he does. And he thinks that King Solomon never heard the puff of a steamboat, nor saw a newspaper, nor smelt chloroform. Therefore, all the wisdom didn't die with him. And so he is in favor of improving masonry. He forgets that perfection in the art of architecture is lost. He thinks he has a patent way for the grips, a new kink in giving the signs. One grand flourish, as, as the Frenchmen say, for the words. In the year he attended the Grand Lodge, he made a three-hour speech developing his ideas, but unfortunately that stubborn body voted them down. Seratame. And Dr. Swayze has never been there since. Brethren who read this little sketch, have you any members of brass value in your lodge? The silver value. The silver value is a white, ponderous, costly, and pure metal. Much sought after, both for mechanical and ornamental purposes. In its nature, it is indestructible. It is rather scarce among the 55 elementary bodies, but very widely diffused throughout nature. The finest specimen of the silver value in Euclid Lodge is Parson Loeb. This reverend brother comes from a silver family, morally speaking, for his brother Robert was so universally beloved, both by Mason and Cohen, that after he died and his poor wife followed him to the grave on account of her grief, their children were raised at the expense of Mason's. And the more than seven years afterwards, a lodge, organized in a room that overlooked his grave, was named Loeb Lodge in honor of his memory. Par Parson Loeb was, is equal to that deceased brother, both in morals, masonry, and religion, and resembles him in, as well in his holy walk and conversation, as in the lineaments of his face recorded in the portrait suspended on this parlor wall. The brethren of Luke Euclid Lodge highly appreciate the silver value of this pure-hearted brother, and they manifest it by using his talents freely in the various lodge offices and duties. He has filled all the elective stations for so frequently, and it has become so much a matter of course to elect him, that when the, an absent brother meets one after St. John's Evangelist Day, his inquiry is, and what did you make of Parsons Jim this time? In fact, he has preambulated the lodge room from east to south and from south to west so frequently and occupied all of the intervening places so thoroughly that the work of masonry comes as a pat to him as it does to preach a sermon on free, free grace. Brother Logue is emphatically a working man. Had he been present at the building of King Solomon's temple, the king would certainly have employed him and put him in honorable station and given him master mason's wages. 
but there are spots in the sun. We must now turn the picture. The good old gentleman lacks something. We cannot elevate him to the highest standard of masonry, and it is for this reason. He does not know the lectures and cannot elucidate the landmarks. The consequence is that he is often compelled to defer his judgment so far to younger men, and it injures his Masonic character to do so. Furthermore, wherein he has conferred a degree, he depends on some brother present to give the lecture, or in default of that sends him home without it, which is a fraud, however innocent the motive, upon the candidate. Again, this reverend brother of the silver value is sadly deficient in the disciplinary regulations of the lodge. He is uninformed as to the principles on which most vital questions are founded. For instance, he cannot say what rule governs in vouching for visitors, or whether a fellow craft mason is or is not to be admitted into a funeral procession, or whether a motion to reconsider can be entertained after balloting or how it can be discovered which member of the lodge cast a black ball. The definitions of Freemasonry have been numerous, and they all unite in declaring it to be a system of morality by the practice of which its members may advance their spiritual interests and mount by the theological ladder from the lodge on earth to the lodge in heaven, end quote by Albert McCoy. He believes that the side degrees are injurious to the interest of masonry, but he cannot prove it. And this gives Dr. Swayze, who is extravagantly fond of such things, as we have said before, a great advantage in the debate. He thinks that Squire Blunt ought to pay his quarterage dues more punctually and attend the stated meetings more regularly, and study the work of masonry more completely. But he has no unanswered ar answerable argument with which to meet that selfish cry. It isn't within the length of my cable toe, end quote, and thus the squire wins the argument. Yet there are many precious virtues in this silver value of Parson Loeb. He preaches all the Mason's funerals in the county, and most beautifully does he perform it too. His independence of thought, his Masonic reputation, his long experience and incorruptibleness of character are a sufficient guarantee to every hearer that he shall have a mental feast. These occasions bring out a large concourse of people who acknowledge their gratification at his success in presenting Masonry so appropriately as the adjunct to Christianity. This excellent brother is generally installed agent in all Masonic charities of his brethren. Is there a widow to be visited, an orphan family to be provided for, perhaps a sick brother to be comforted? Parson Logue is the man, ever ready, always willing, and ever efficient. Whole chapters might be written to illustrate his silver value, and a volume of anecdotes paraded to show it up, but a single instance must su suffice. The two Masonic brothers, both amphibious, Thomas Lane and Jacob Hall, had quarreled. The original difficulty was as insignificant one, connected with some church matter, but the sore had come to a head. On a five-dollar account which Hall brought up against Lane, and a bad offensive sore it proved to be, many a stamp with the foot had well nigh led to a smite with the hand. But thus far the Lord had led them on, and they had not come up to blows. Mischief, however, had been heaped upon mischief, and rumor upon rumor, and the breach was every day widening. When Brother Logue and the Silver Mason declared that the quarrel had proceeded far enough, and he would go a frogging himself to settle it, his first most notion was to buy up the aforesaid five-dollar account, and present it to Brother Lane, receipted in full. Then he took back Brother Lane's thanks and respects to Brother Hall, and then Brother Hall's warm good wishes to Brother Lane. Then he brought the two parties face to face at his house, accidentally, of course, and the whole thing was reconciled in five minutes, natural as a turnip. The best of it was that they both handed in their demits to the Euclid Lodge, and were elected without a demur and became active members, thus diminishing the number of croakers by two. 
It is said it is just such things as these that hold brother lives for. And if he didn't believe there was a Mason Lodge in the next world, he would care very little about going there. Brethren who read this little sketch, have you any members of the silver value in your lodge? Then let every Mason prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. The Gold Value Gold is about sixteen times more valuable than silver. Estimating iron at four cents a pound, gold exceeds that metal in value nearly five thousand times. In other words, it will nearly take five thousand pounds of iron to purchase one of gold. We do not know the relative value of the four metals in King Solomon's time, but there must have been great disproportion, for we observe the numbers 8, 17, 18, and 100 representing the number of talents, respectively, that were consumed in the temple. The division of officers and artificers is also indicative of great disproportion. Viz. 3, 300, 3,300, and 80,000. A fine specimen of the gold value in the Euclid Lodge is Brother Coverley, and would that we could worthily display his character. But who can describe the refined gold of the temple as it flashed answering back to the good God of the day? From every pinnacle and spearhead upon the roof, no foul bird was to alight there and defile it, no vile flesh was to encumber it. It was to reflect nothing but the holy, but holiness to the Lord. When Brother Coverley first became a Mason, it was long, long ago, not a hand which then hailed him with the brother's grip, but is now consumed in death. He embarked in it as a man would encounter some abstruse science that demands time and toil and talent to comprehend. He had his choice between the four values, gold, silver, brass, and iron. He might have come up to the iron value, merely by possessing himself of the grips and a few technicalities of the order. But this had no temptation for him. Once a mason, always a mason, is a severe truth, and Brother Coverley early declared that when a man enters any state of existence, either with or without his own consent, pr uh, prudence dictates that he should make it as tolerable as he may. So he took hold of the thing vigorously and vowed to see it to the end of it. He might have attained to the brass value with great facility or faculty by uniting the more obvious beauties of masonry to those engrafted into the other secret societies. He could have displayed his talent and gained high honors with the mass, but he declared himself opposed to polygamy. He didn't believe in breathing in and in love pure blood would sow no new patches upon, upon old garments, and therefore he never joined any other secret society and jested at the idea of dipping water from the spring branch below when he could have a free access to the spring head above. He might have gone up to the silver value and stood side by side with that exemplary brother, Parson Lowe. He had all the qualifications in advance of a prepared heart a consistent life, a good education, experience for this world, and religion for the next. Masonry can add but little to such as that, to bring her votaries up to the silver value. This little was soon acquired. He learned the work of masonry in a few days, while after a year's novitiate, he none could preside with more dignity or wield the gavel with more propriety than he. The honors of the lodge and of the grand lodge were awarded him. The brethren had respect to their own interest in his speedy evaluation, and soon Brother Coverley began to be looked upon as the embodiment of the principles and practice of Freemasonry both at home and abroad. But all this was far from satisfying in his mind. The silver value, however precious and pure, ranks but second in the scale of Masonic values, and his heart aspired excelsior. Having the beauty and skill of the widow's son, the strength and fullness of the Tyrian monarch, he sighed for the wisdom of the king of Israel, and he made the gold of Ophir his standard of masonry. 
Those who aim high may not hit their mark, but they will assuredly send their missiles to a more extensive flight. These considerations influencing the mind of Brother Coverley, he resolved to make three sacrifices on the altar of masonry, yea, four, time, study, will, and money. The expenditure of the latter procured Masonic books for his study and the personal experience of Masons for his guidance. The outlay of the former gave him that further experience of Masons which is recorded in books. To these he added the stock he had gathered in his own person. The sacrifice of his will, he was delighted with the old symbol, the Masonic slipper, purchased for him one of the principal secrets of masonry, a secret which thousands who pass through our lodges, chapters, councils, and company would and incur much expense of money never do acquire. And the knowledge of that secret, it was more than all the rest which ennobled him. Brother Coverley early adopted the opinion that the work of masonry is to the senses what the lectures are to the mind, and that the lectures themselves should only be considered as a text to the development of those principles, wise, strong, and beautiful, which underlie, like the immense stones which were in the temple's base, the whole moral system. Pursuing the subject by the aid of tradition, revelation, and the study of symbols, he arrived at this sketch of Masonic theology, that there is a God, that he created man and placed him in circumstances of happiness, that man forfeited his blessings and was banished to an inferior state, that to repenting humanity God promised restoration, that the unrepentant were destroyed by water, and the miracles were worked to release the people from God from bondage and to strengthen them with hope, and that a tabernacle and afterwards a temple were constructed on a divine plan to fix the promises by symbols and types. Who that has stood by him in the sanctum of the Euclid Lodge and heard his thrilling illustration of the doctrine of the resurrection through Jonah's, Judah's lion, but what has felt like declaring his feelings in Jacob's own words. This is no other than the house of God, and this is the very gate of heaven. And then has gone forth with a firmer faith in the religious tendencies of the order than he had before. The course of Masonic labor drafted on this trestle, his trestle board, being actively pursued for many years, elevated Brother Coverley to the gold value. He can see why Masons should pay quarterage dues punctually and attend the stated meetings promptly and study Freemasonry diligently. He can tell not only that Masons must not gamble, drink, swear, and fight, but that why they must not. And his why is an overwhelming why, irresistible and unanswerable. In addition to an exposition of the landmarks of Masonry, Brother Coverley has devoted himself at great cost of time and money to the disciplinary regulations of a lodge. When he commenced the study of his topic, it was in vast confusion. The various Masonic journals in America had not touched upon it. There was no standard authority of faith and practice on his head. To acquire the necessary information then demanded patience, study, correspondence, and travel. But Brother Coverley has it plumbed, squared, and leveled now. He knows whether or not each lodge must be opened and closed separately, what code of Masonic laws is universal and universally binding, what amount of Masonic knowledge is comprehended in the term suitable proficiency, and what are the privileges and what the responsibilities of a demented Mason, to which lodge the petitioners for a new lodge belong. Whether an adjournment of the lodge can be made on a motion and a myriad of the same sort. Not only is he able to give you a satisfactory answer to such questions, but he advances such arguments and offers such reasons, all based upon the ancient and admitted landmarks, that you yourself are perfectly convinced and you feel able to convince everyone else who has got an ear to hear. Brother Coverley is not an opponent of side degrees as such. On the contrary, he knows too well that all the degrees, save the first three, are in strictest such confidence, but yet that some of them are essential to the understanding of symbolic masonry.
Instead, therefore, of offering a blind opposition to psi degrees and mass, he separates such as are instructive from such as are merely impressive and in rejecting those, for the larger part, which are neither. He gives a relative place to the rest. This good brother of the gold value is opposed to all innovations from whatever source or motive they may spring. He opposes such large numbers in a single lodge, such irregular hours, such a rush of work, or so much demitting, opening the lodge door so wide, so much gigaw and tinsel and decoration, the modern bastard politeness in lodge work, the arbitrary bylaws, and the other things not lawful to mention here. He makes his opposition practical. When Triangle Lodge, in his vicinity, imitated the old fellow, odd fellows and fixed a sliding panel in the door of their lodge room, for the convenience of the tiler, Brother Coverley, being deputy grandmaster at the time, nailed it up with his own hands and terrified the members by asseverating that curiosity once killed the tiler and that he thought another one was in great danger of his life. There is a tradition of float in this country, or in this county, that seeing the tiler peep into the room one day while he was presiding, he threw his gavel at him, and with so much precision as to strike that respectable functionary <laughs> directly upon the forehead, and thus to knock off considerable of the vices and superfluities of his life. Knock some sense into him, in other words. And whether this tale be true or not, we know that the Tylers all dread Brother Coverley as far as they can see him. Such is our understanding of the gold value in Euclid Lodge. Brothers, you who read this little sketch, have you any such in your lodge? If you have, prize them. For as our Grand Master saith, wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared with it. You will miss them when they die, and well for you if the loss do not prove to be irrep irreparable. The same plumb square and level with which you level the footstone of your mansion will be used to level the block above your grave. But oh, with what different emotions! So when we essay the metals of our lodge and pronounce this one or that one to be up to the gold standard, we enjoy far happier feelings than when called upon by the stroke of death to declare in the words of Jeremiah, how has the fine gold become dimmed? Prize them, brothers, <clears throat> while they yet walk, and work and shine among you. Your iron and your brass may be replaced. Your silver, although its loss will be greatly mourned, can be supplied. For the mine is large and the metal widely diffused. But who shall replace your fine gold? Brethren, <clears throat> young and zealous. Oh, I need to take a drink because my throat's so dry. <clears throat> young and zealous who look forward to the double aim of masonry, getting good and doing good, aim for the gold value. Slight the other metals, but strive for the crown, for the pure yellow glittering gold of masonry. Who amongst you will attain the gold value? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord of God of Israel, for he is God which is in Jerusalem. Amen, so mote it be. Post notes. The Amun Rizan declares that, and I quote, more than 40 or 50 members, when they can attend regularly, as the wholesome rules of the craft require, are generally found inconvenient for working to advantage. The declaration is true to this day. Double edge. These are the replacements that were in the places that you, you know, you saw them in, as we were reading. We intend no disrespect by the term amphibious. An amphibious animal is one that inhabits land and water and looks miserable in both. The a demitted mason never looks happy amidst the brethren, and he certainly cannot feel so when he is away from them. Okay, so, and masonry recognizes this moral truth that every man is endowed by his creator with a consciousness of right and wrong, and that conscience is his own rule of action. And unfortunately, that's not true. A lot of people actually do not know the difference between right and wrong. 
Um, the eagerness with which these nonsensical farces are swallowed by some Masons is amusing. And that was up at the, you know, the, there were spots throughout this reading where you saw these little marks. And, like, there's the chit chit right there. And, and it goes on. So that's what these are re referencing to. And so the author earnestly prays that he may not be misunderstood in these remarks. A membership in several secret associations at the same time is not a criminal offense, nor would he so present it. But it weakens the powers of an individual Mason, and so much divides his energies that Freemasonry, a system which demands great study and much time to comprehend it, receives but an equal share with those modern associations which need neither. Um... You know, jack of all trades, master of none, in other words. So, and then furthermore, the, the landmarks of masonry were in the origin of that principle connected with the laws of the Persians. Neither of them could be altered. And several of the American Grand Lodges have ordered by special enactment that the subordinate lodges give the whole of the lecture in immediate connection with the degree. The principle is so philosophically correct, and the opposite course so manifestly unjust, that it is wonderful any should neglect it. This uh, joke, okay, furthermore, this joke is a ponderous one, requires explanation. Frogs are amphibious, so are demitted masons. To go a frogging, then, morally speaking, is to settle difficulties between demitted masons. QED. This remark, and number two, this remark, though it may sound irrelevant to some, will not, will not to a well-informed Mason. Okay, and that was above. We read a few remarks that actually you would have to be a well-informed Mason to understand, and I'm not going to go back through them. Um, you should have picked up on them when I was reading it, if, if you have the uh, ears to hear and eyes to see. So, and a uh, third mark is those who are made masons for the purpose of learning their secret may deceive themselves, for they may be fifty years masters of their chairs, worshipful masters, or even wardens, and yet not learn the secrets of the brotherhood. And this is in D. Sigwald's uh, memoirs, Seingalt's memoirs, and there never was a truer sediment than this, and, and this is still true so much to this day, like I've said so many times before. And these are the standards of Masons, you know, you have your, your, and we call them all Blue Lodge Masons, you know, and, and when we're talking about, oh, that's the Blue Lodge Masons don't know anything. Well, some of them do, some of them don't. People, uh, just like in any system, when they get into this, they can uh, progress at their own rate, and it just they make up their own mind what standard they're going to go for and what grade they're going to be defined by. Um, by side degrees, we mean those are explanatory of, of the symbolic. Uh, this definition, however, would include the RA, the Royal Art degree. Um, Mason, and, and, you know, whether it's the Royal Arts, the Malta, the Templar, the uh, Rosh Kruch, you know, on and on. All right, so masonry, according to the general acceptance of the term, is an art founded on their principles of geometry and devoted to the service and convenience of mankind. But Freemasonry, embracing a wider range and having a nobler object in view, namely the cultivation and improvement of the human mind, may be more pr with may with more pr propriety be called a science inasmuch as availing itself of the terms of the former it inculcates the principles of the purest morality though its lessons are for the most part veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols and this is contained in light and shadows freemasons uh, re, uh, consisting of masonic tales songs and sketches by rob morris um, lecture on the landmarks and works of Freemasonry in Louis, Louis, Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, published by J. F. Brennan for the author of 1852. <laughs> and I thank you for joining me.